Hi folks, Jennifer Nelson here with Pocket Hours. Pocket Hours is the only podcast made by realtors for realtors. Come listen as I interview high producing brokers to hear their best practices. And don't forget that while you are listening, you are also earning clock hour credit. Tune in every other week to hear from someone new. And please remember to tell your broker friends about Pocket Hours so more folks can elevate their business. Be the agent you would hire. Looking forward to having you listen in. Good morning, folks. Jennifer Nelson here with Pocket Hours. I have the privilege of interviewing Caitlin Jackson today. She's a senior associate at Dimension Law. She is a landlord tenant attorney. And if you are a person who owns property that rents it, if you help investors uh, as a realtor buy investment property, if you are a tenant yourself, this is a podcast you don't want to miss. So many changes came into effect in the last three years over the pandemic, and we are responsible for all this information and getting it all right. This is a cursory view of some of those. We dig into it a little bit, but overall the message is know that there are a bunch of changes you're responsible for and get a property manager to take care of them for you. But if you're advising people who are interested in investment property and in becoming a landlord, here's a couple of things that I think you would want to know. Here we go. Caitlin, thank you so much for your time today. Happy to have you on the show. Oh, thanks for inviting me. I look forward to speaking with everybody. The reason I thought about this podcast and was talking to Caitlin about it over a couple calls was because we have, on occasion, and actually some more than others, brokers have people that say, we'd like to buy a house and we'd like that to be our investment house. We'd like to make it a rental. And there is so much that has to go on (laughs) to make that successful. And I wanted Caitlin to be on the show to talk about what we should know, sort of some of the ins and outs of helping our clients decide whether they want to be a landlord some of the new changes in the city of Seattle for landlord-tenant law. A couple of the things that are going to come up are specific to Seattle, but I think we can talk in generalities to Washington State. But just in general, there is a whole bunch that goes into all of this, and that's why you have work, Caitlin. We're grateful for the work that you do, but certainly it's it's a big deal to become a landlord in Seattle. So I'm excited to have you on the show. How about that? Yeah, thanks. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to share the amount of knowledge that I have that I've amassed in the last two and a half years of COVID changes related to landlord tenant law at the state and local and county levels, because it has been an absolute roller coaster ride. And the world of owning rental property is very different now than it was even three years ago. I mean, it's March 27th. That means that basically to the day, we are three years through the the, the COVID wow. um, moratoria and all the changes that happened, a lot of which was coming down. I think I remember looking at signed orders that said March 27th. And I'm thinking, wow, what a three years it's been. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. What We're all a little fatigued and sort of coming back out of it. I have a seven-year-old daughter. Her name is Ruthie, and she hit, started school first grade this year. And she's still learning how to communicate with other kids because usually at this point in a kid's life, they will have been in preschool and they would have been a couple different years, right, up, leading up to this first grade mark that would give you some practice at this. And she's a little bit rusty, as it were, in terms of talking to other kids. So we're working on that. This is also a COVID thing that's happening. So Caitlin, before we get into the nuts and bolts of landlord tenant stuff, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you live, family, pets, all that stuff. So I live in Normandy Park, Washington. I am a born and raised, I'd call myself a Seattleite. So I have grown up in this area. I went to school, Kennedy High School, not that that matters, but I went to Seattle U (laughs) undergrad, and then I also went to Seattle U for law school. I played soccer there. I genuinely am a very like Seattle girl, if you will. I'm married. I have a dog named Rosie. I have a son named Campbell. (laughs) My husband's name is James. He's an engineer and he's working on the Seattle waterfront project. So we are a Seattle family. (laughs) I guess so. And I see those of you that are just listening into the podcast, you can't see this, but I think I see a Peloton seat there next to you on the recording. (laughs) (laughs) A Pelotoner. I like it. (laughs) Very cool. Yeah. My husband, I would say more than me because I get to go, I still play soccer at night, play like regular adult league games. 
But on the nights that I can't and I need to work out, yeah, the Peloton is there. <laughs> <laughs> Works pretty well, doesn't it? it does. I like it. Yeah, it does. <laughs> So tell me, you've said the last couple of years through the pandemic, but how long have you been practicing law? I've been practicing landlord-tenant law since January, I think, of 2018. I want to say January, February of 2018. So it's been, oh my God, what year is it now? Okay, so five years. It feels like 50. (laughs) No doubt. (laughs) I hear that. Um, And one of the cool slash terrible things about landlord-tenant law is that because the changes that have happened since COVID are so stark and so significant and really changed the entire game of landlord-tenant law in Washington, it really leveled the playing fields when it comes to practicing this area because it didn't matter and it doesn't matter if you have 30 years of experience or five. The changes were so significant. Your previous experience didn't help you. As a matter of fact, I'd argue that for the attorneys that had been practicing longer, it actually hurt them because they were so used to things being a particular way, relearning the whole gamut. A lot of them just stopped doing it full stop um, because it was just too difficult. Yeah, it's just too difficult. So let's dig into just a little bit of that. So landlord-tenant law, as far as I understand it, and of course, your knowledge is going to be exponentially different than mine, but sort of went along a certain way for many years, right? Like little changes here and there. Mm-hmm. And then pandemic hits and all bets are off. Everything shifts or a lot shifts. And even some Seattle, longtime Seattle investors who have rentals here are pulling out, selling their investment properties and buying other cities because of many, many changes in laws going into effect that are pretty tenant friendly. Can you talk, I guess there's a lot of changes, but can you talk just about a few big ones that happened? during the pandemic. Right. And I want to be careful not to scare everybody because the Pacific Northwest is still a fabulous area to live and work in. And the property values have stayed really strong, even despite the unknowns of the economic situation we are in now or predict ourselves to be in. However, the unique situation that exists in Washington state is that Washington does not have what we call a preemption clause when it comes to statutory landlord-tenant laws, meaning whatever our state does, the cities and the counties can also act in those areas. So in Washington, we have something like 300 cities. Theoretically, each one of those cities could have their own set of landlord-tenant laws, and you'd have to stack what that city is doing up with what the state has done and what the federal government has done as well. And so you have to, as a landlord, navigate all those levels at the same time Hmm, and make sure that you are not violating any of the tenants' rights through that process. And that has become very complicated. And we've had several cases. I'm on the board uh, for the Rental Housing Association of Washington as well. And RHA successfully brought a case, I think, with the city of Burien relatively recently against the city of Burien's own landlord tenant laws, which conflicted with what the state has done as well. And so what came of that was basically the cities can't override what rights are granted to the plaintiff or the landlord in a, in a landlord-tenant relationship. But so you have to read this, the city laws and wherever there's not an overlap, you know, whatever the city has done survives, which makes it, in my opinion, even harder because now you're having to read word for word, line for line, and try to rectify these two statutes or these two sets of laws against each other and figure out which ones are knocked out and which ones are still alive. And wow. And that's even more complicated with the city of Seattle. (laughs) For sure. The city of Seattle likes to pass landlord tenant law it feels like weekly you have a new ordinance coming out. Okay. They find all sorts of ways just to make things time consuming and complicated. <laughs> an example of that would be they had passed an ordinance that said, hey, we have this landlord tenant handbook. It's like 37 pages long in color. You have to send that handbook out printed in color, you know, every time you get a new tenant and you're supposed to send it to them. Every time you send a notice or a renewal. Wow. I think some of that may have changed when it comes to renewals. But once again, it's too difficult for even me to keep up with where I don't even look (laughs) unless I if I have a question in front of me, because 
it could be true one day and it could be false another day. So you have to basically just relearn it every time you open up their ordinances. And what I find kind of hilarious about that is like Seattle is supposed to be this like super green, you know, space where, oh, we (laughs) care about the trees. But do you know how much paper and ink is wasted if you have to send that 37 page? They required you to print it in color. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> wow. And in color, how random. In like, why color. Does it yeah. Yeah. Why it was, does that matter? Uh, okay. It is quite amazing. And then like, for example, another ordinance they passed recently is rent increase ordinance. So it used to be that you could send a rent increase notice in different ways. So long as you could reasonably rely on the tenant would receive it. Now it has to be served with certified mail and you have to go and try to personally hand deliver it. I mean, it just adds a lot of additional, you know, work and you have to, you know, have your declaration of service and detail all of the steps that you took t- to make sure that they received the notice in the way, almost as if in the same way if they had done something critical on the property and you needed to terminate their tenancy, you basically have to serve the notice the same way. And those are two tiny, tiny, tiny examples. As we will probably discuss later in this show, there's a lot of other things Seattle has done and continues to do. I sort of started to say this, but it seems like Seattle, and rightfully so on some level, really favors the tenant. I mean, some of these rules and changes have come about because there are people that find themselves in situations where they really are being taken advantage of from a landlord. And so we understand that some laws come into effect that disadvantage a whole bunch of people, but trying their best to try to help the few, (laughs) right? So talk to me a little bit about what can landlords do, people that are interested in investing. So as real estate agents, we're helping some people that say, we'd like to own a rental. And what are some things that you think landlords can do to protect themselves in the ever-changing landlord-tenant law things that happen, as you said, weekly, there might be a change in something. Is there anything that comes to mind that you could have us know that we can pass on to our clients? It really depends on what phase of the tenancy that you're purchasing that property in. So I have different advice or maybe just slightly different advice if you're buying property that is already tenant occupied versus a property that you're going to purchase and then make it a tenant occupied property. So for a tenant occupied property, if it's a multi, let's just use multifamily property as an example, I'm going to buy it. Maybe it's got eight different units in it and it's an each unit is already tenant occupied. One of the first things that I ask purchasers or potential purchasers are, did you request copies of three things? Well, two things really, but one is the lease agreements that are already in place, right? Because your rights may be significantly different whether or not there is a written lease agreement or if there is not a written lease agreement or what the lease agreement actually says, right? And then the other is a rent roll. So a rent ledger, an actual proof of where each unit is at in terms of what the rent is and what has remained paid or when it was paid and how much was has paid. I can tell you, I can see a snapshot in terms of like what type of tenant or tenancy exists, not just in looking at how much has been paid or how much is charged, but when payments are made. If they're due on the first, but I see in that rent roll that they actually make multiple payments a month to make sure that they've actually paid their rent. So let's say rent's $3,000 a month. That's a lot of money, but let's just use it as a clean number. Rent is due on the first. And I see that on a regular basis, $1,700 of that is paid on the second. And then the balance is paid on the 7th or the 12th. And I see that relatively regularly. The indication there is that you may have maxed out the room for rent increases in that unit. You're probably dealing with a tenant that's already struggling to make that kind of rent. And what that would tell you is, well, if I have to raise rent again, because if you're going to buy the property at a price that would require you to raise rent to make it a viable investment, well, Seattle, first of all, it requires six months to raise rent at all. And if you raise rent 10% or more in a 12-month period, you may have to pay relocation assistance to that tenant in order to help them find a place to move. Or even after they've already moved, they have like, I think they have like three months or six months to then retroactively apply for relocation assistance to be paid out of that landlord's pocket. So those are stories, and that is useful information for gleaning what kind of wiggle room you have in rent. The other details I ask is, Have you ever heard of an estoppel agreement 
or mm-hmm. estoppel documents. So it's very common in commercial spaces. If you're going to buy a commercial space, you get from the tenants a document called an estoppel agreement where the tenant basically gives you, the purchaser, the promise that certain information about their agreement is true. Now, why would that be necessary? Because technically you can modify a lot of agreements orally. So when the seller turns over a written rental agreement, you might not necessarily know whether or not they've modified that agreement orally at some point that could affect what you actually are buying or what the agreement is. Once the previous owner is out of the question, you may not have the ability to sue them if they didn't give you the honest truth or the most up-to-date information. And your remedies are pretty limited against an entity or a person who is no longer around. Who you want to enforce it against is the person who's in or the entity that is in possession of the property itself that you own. So that's what the estoppel agreement is so important for us because it creates a contract between you and the person or entity that is in possession of your property. Mm, And so if they want to turn around and say, oh, I know my lease agreement says that it's $3,000 a month, but because I fixed this broken toilet and sink and the floors were damaged and I repaired them, the landlord told me that they would reduce my rent for X amount of months to $2,000 a month. Now you have a document that says, no, that's not the case because you signed this estoppel agreement that said rent is $3,000 a month and that there's no outstanding issues with regard to the state of the property or repairs or maintenance requests. And that's another detail that is massively important, especially in the city of Seattle, is they have very strict rules about what you can do if the property is not up to date If there's outstanding maintenance or repair issues, you may not even be able to terminate a tenancy if there's outstanding maintenance or repair issues. So when you step into the shoes of the owner, if you're going to become the owner, you absorb those liabilities. So you want to make sure you know what you're stepping into. We talked at the beginning of this just a few minutes ago, Kaylin, about, you know, we don't want to scare anyone away, but we also want to be thorough, which is the reason for this podcast today is to say, it sounds like a great idea and it can be a a lucrative business. It can be a great sort of diversification of your portfolio, right? I am a success story myself. I have six rentals in Seattle and, you know, I need to find a piece of wood and knock on it right now. But to say, for the most part, I think I've done a decent job of keeping that flowing well, good communication and so forth. But when we have clients that say to us, we'd like to keep this property, we're going to buy another one, we'd like to make it a rental. It's nice to have a couple of things to say to them. Well, if you're stepping into a landlord position, here's some sites I would suggest you read up on. Here's a resource. Caitlin, I'm sure you're one of those we'd love to pass on to to clients to just say, let's talk this through and figure out if this is a good house to do that with. Right. Or uh, what are all the ins and outs? Talk to me a little bit about the first to apply rule in Seattle. I might be behind the ball on this if that's gone away already or if it came back. Like you said, it sort of shifts all the time. But is that true that if you have a house for rent, you are the owner of that house and the landlord, the first person to apply if they meet your requirements is the person that you have to rent to? Is that still true? Still true. Okay. How do I say this without sounding terrible? But the way to get around that in a legal way, I guess, is to say, make sure your requirements are exactly what you want. Meaning make that list lengthy to be able to say, can we get the right tenant in the right house? Here's some things that we'd like to have as requirements. Your facial expression's changing. Listeners well, can't I hear think this, that but... the, the language of getting around that's kind no, of yeah, yeah. sticky. Okay. I would not say that. I would <laughs> say you must comply with it. But the way yeah. to comply is to make sure that go. your rental criteria is exactly yes. who you would choose anyway. Yes, yes. That's what I meant to say. Sorry. <laughs> there we go. Complying and making your criteria the exact person. Yes. See, so that's lawyer speak and that's me as a landlord speak. There's the difference. Comply. <laughs> we like that. Yeah. So, and that's to say what ended up happening in a in a really expensive rental market like Seattle right, is that one of the reasons this law came into effect is because there was many, many people being discriminated against, not getting there fast enough, whatever the case might was. Is that, am I correct in why that first to apply? That was the perception. I would argue that in practice, first in time has actually hurt more of those individuals than what it was intended to help. It was the perception that people who are 
come from traditionally marginalized cultures or races for whatever reason or have disabilities, the perception was that they were being discriminated against and not qualifying for housing. And so they said, well, we're just going to make it an even playing field. And the way we do that is make sure that whoever pushes the send button on that application first, the landlord has no discretion because the assumption was that landlords who have discretion will use that discretion to harm marginalized individuals, whether intentionally or unintentionally. Yeah. Okay. What has actually happened has been that the only people who have time to sit around <laughs> all day and look for rentals and have all of their documents uploaded as PDFs and can show proof of their credit score right away and can, you know, hit all those check boxes are not the people that they were intending to protect. As a matter of fact, I think it's actually in my opinion, just in how I see it's played out in my personal experience, has been people with steady jobs at a computer, particularly at tech companies, are the ones who actually have benefited most from this rule. <laughs> for sure. I mean, even tenants that I've had said that they were sitting at work, you know, with their screen up for work over here and their screen over here and just hitting refresh, refresh, refresh on some of these sites for places to live until, you know, one popped up and they don't even know, they haven't hardly looked at the pictures, but what they know to do now is to go ahead and hurry up and get that application in place to hopefully be the first one. So then they can decide later. So to your point, which I think is a great one, that there's an amount of luxury, right? An amount of privilege that comes with just the option to be able to do that first. People so. who have, you know, minimum wage jobs where they work mm. at restaurants yeah. or they work yeah. at, you know, they work manual labor positions. Those are the the individuals who have been significantly hurt more by that ordinance. My hope is that the city council totally goes a 180 with this one because it talk about swinging and missing just mm -hmm. an abs. <laughs> I think I, it's called punching underwater. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. That's a good visual on that one. Absolutely. Uh, let's turn now just to a minute. There are other rules around not evicting families with school kids during the school year. Another one's about not evicting someone during winter. I'm throwing things out. You know, let's more, talk about it. More I got all me. of it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, let's start with with children. Okay. Because it is not school kids. It is okay. any person under the age of eighteen. It doesn't okay. matter. They could be homeschooled. They could be in Seattle's public schools. They could be in private school. They could be at West Side. They could be at the most expensive school in the city. <laughs> right. It doesn't right. matter if it's a person under 18. There is a very thorough prohibition against evictions. And it's not just related to non-payment of rent. Um, I okay. think that's one of the common misconceptions about that uh, ordinance is there's very, very limited exceptions to that ordinance. That means I think owner occupancy is an exception. I do not think selling the property is an exception. Hmm. I'd wow. have to look okay. it up again, but I'm relatively certain it's very, it's one of the most limited ordinance with limited exceptions. Is that new pandemic new or has that mm -hmm. been around a while? Okay, new pandemic. Okay. I think that one was passed in 2021, I okay. want to say. But like I said, they've been changing stuff so much I may be confusing it. But yeah, that's pretty new. And so the rule essentially is that you cannot remove a tenant if there's a person under 18 there. And it's not even that they have to be there full time. I think that even if you are a guardian, it's extensive to them. So let's say, hypothetically speaking, you have two parents that are separated and one of them has custody on the weekends. Like that would count. They would still be protected. Or if it's sure. a an older cousin that has guardianship and also helps part time, that's also true. And it's not just children. It's any employee of the school district. It's any person that works for the school district, not just teachers. I mean, it go, it's very extensive. Okay. Um, yeah. So teacher, wow. admin. I think there's even like part-time bus drivers, like anybody that's related to the school district is going to be protected by that. I'm going to just be candid from a landlord position. And I, I probably have already stuck my foot in my mouth a few times in this interview. Here I go again. And that's to say, 
good or bad, what that does immediately from a landlord perspective in my head is say, I sure hope a teacher or people with kids under 18 don't rent my house. Because if in the event that they I need to remove them, I have a lot more limitation on me. So I know that's not the intention of the law, but from my perspective, that's an immediate thought that comes to mind. Of course, I totally understand that when it comes to pure risk mitigation and your yeah. job as a business owner is generally to risk mitigate. The issue there is that, you know, that's a big risk because the school year is long. It is September. I think that the way it's written is any time between September and June 17th or 18th, I want to say. So, and the other piece, and I, once again, I really try not to scare people, but I want people to really understand just how complicated this can be if you get stuck in it is it's if the eviction could happen during the school year, meaning once the sheriff's office has been handed the order, I think there's this perception that the removal happens quickly. The sheriff's office wants 50 days to process any order to evict. So let's wow. say, hypothetically speaking, you had to terminate a tenancy for failure to comply with material lease terms. That's not an exception, I don't think, to that, that ordinance. So you may have to wait until the end of the school year to remove somebody because, let's say, they're smoking inside the property or, and I don't know why I have a few of these cases, but they've removed their front door. Uh, Random. <laughs> don't have a <laughs> front door anymore. And every time you put up a new door, they take it down. Who knows? Right. Okay. And so the sheriff's office may not even process that paperwork. It takes 50 days. So let's say you get it by June 17th. That's all of July. And then you have September 1st. You have days to try to get that done. So I can tell you there's a few cases where it's it's not just you wait those 10 months. It's you're going to wait potentially years because all it takes is the sheriff's office saying, sorry, we just don't have time. And this has been another like unintended consequence, I think, by the city council is that you're basically putting a workload on the sheriff's office that is impossible for them to keep up with. For sure. The yep. state law says that any order from a court like that has to be executed in 10 days with an exception of 10 more days if they need it. They won't do it in 50. They don't even care what the state law says. So, and now I don't, um, I don't want to like continue to scare people, but the, sh <laughs> the one of the deputies last week, I don't know if you guys saw on the news, but one of the deputies was shot processing an eviction wow. in Ballard. And that means three of those deputies, because they were there were three on site, they're all on leave. So there's only a three handful that people. do them anyway. Right. And now even less. <laughs> right. Now even fewer right. people since they don't want to get shot. Wow. Right. Okay. So talk to me a little bit about winter. What is the definition of winter in regards to that? So the winter eviction... I think it's more catered towards non-payment of rent. I don't, okay. I think that one's a little bit less strict than the school year eviction ban, but it is the same thing where if the eviction could happen December 1st through March 1st for non-payment of rent, it cannot be processed in that time. So once again, I had cases that had concluded by mid-October and I still had to wait for the eviction ban to totally go away for winter because the sheriff's office, even though they had the order from the court and that case started at the end of August, they couldn't get it done before December 1st. Wow. So really, it doesn't mean you can't start your case in that time period. It means you have to start your case by September, August. Wow. So yeah, it's a long process. If I have a non-payment of rent case, I'm telling people and, you know, some attorneys might you know, disagree with me on this because it, it's all about your own internal policies and procedures. But four to six months is what it's going to take. I mean, average, I would say. Okay, that, that was my next. Yeah, that was my next question. And I think this goes hand in hand with what hopefully we'll continue to say throughout the rest of the conversation is that as your people are coming to you and saying, we're interested in being landlords. One of the questions that I would say right away is, how much savings do you have right for this house and to have a minimum of six months of all expenses in an account ready to go in the event that you don't get paid. Because if you're month to month or, hey, we make $500 every month on this house and you haven't saved that up, 
to prepare for non-payment, you're going to get in trouble. And now this is right. Your credit is being impacted by non-payment of a mortgage. Pocket Hours is brought to you by Scout Real Estate. Hi, I'm Jennifer Nelson, owner at Scout Real Estate. I started this firm with the vision of doing things differently with our focus on legendary service for our clients and creating a community of producing agents to spur each other to do higher quality work. If you are interested in learning more about how a small group of like-minded brokers have come together to have some fun while doing a lot of business, reach out to me, 206-227-7966, or email jennifer at scoutrealestate.com. I promise you this, fun is a high priority for me, but so is winning. So if you appreciate those two things, you might be interested in Scout. Looking forward to hearing from you. So would you say six to nine months? What would you say for a buffer on that? I think that's reasonable. I don't think that's not reasonable. I just think that there are some other changes that exist in Washington state that have made that situation much more dire. One is that the biggest change to state law, in my opinion, has been the right to counsel for any Mm. eviction, for any reason right is now they have a now the tenant if they are an indigent tenant has a right to an attorney now people when they hear indigent think oh it's somebody who's really in dire straits and that's not just that's just not the truth i have a case right now that's going to go to trial and the the defendant is the sole beneficiary and trustee of a trust that has a million dollars worth of property in it but because that money isn't her personal money she's considered indigent Wow. And so this defendant will have full representation from the, you know, non-payment of rent perspective for the violations, for the show cause hearing, for the trial. And if let's say I win at trial, let's assume I'm going to win at trial. I think I'm going to win at trial. <laughs> if they appeal to the court of appeals, she gets that free too. So that's probably an equivalent of thirty or forty thousand dollars in attorney's fees that will be strapped to the landlord because if she appeals, somebody has to represent the plaintiff in that, and so they will have they'll be dragged into an appeal, wow. and they don't have a choice, and they have to have an attorney. And remember, one of the pros and cons of being an investor is that hey, you're not personally liable, but if it's an LLC that you've created in order to protect yourself, the LLC has to have an attorney to represent it. And there is no such thing as pro se representation in superior court. You can't even cut down your costs by saying, I will go to court on behalf of my LLC. No, you won't. You'll get kicked right out of court. Got it. So, so yeah, so this change, is that also a pandemic change? Yeah, all of this is, br- is new. All of I this, mean, oh, the, okay. the right to representation actually started in 2021. That was one of the big legislative changes. Yeah. Not only are your six to nine months in reserve to just keep your mortgage going while you're trying to figure out what to do with this tenant that's like, let's pretend they're not paying. Let's make it somewhat easy, right? They're not paying. You try to evict this tenant and, oh, it's during the winter. You're, you got to wait. Oh, wait. You know, they have kids that are school age under 18 or anyone that works for the school district in their family. You're out for this amount of time. And then on top of it, if they end up figuring out that they want an attorney, They get one for free. You've got to show up with representation because, right, here we go into court. You can't represent yourself. And so the fees could just mount and mount and mount by the time you get this done. So, and let me say this, Caitlin, and you can correct me again. Obviously, again, I keep saying this over and over again. You know this stuff. I'm coming in from one perspective only, and that's to say it felt easier before. And again, not maybe not the best, but it felt easier that, oh, tenants not paying. I serve them notice, here's the timeline, here's the sheriff, here's what happens. And in a relatively short amount of time, they're out, I find a new tenant, we keep going in our lives. It doesn't feel like that's the case anymore. No. So remember that an eviction, let's use the formal language, is is called an unlawful detainer. So somebody's unlawfully detaining possession of the property from you, the owner or landlord. That legal procedure was created specifically to resolve this limited issue of who has the right to possession and if there's rent due, how much is due. That was pretty much what the court was limited to answering and to handling. And it was created as a legal vehicle to make that quick and efficient. 
It used to happen in about 30 to 45 days. And the reason for that was because if you sue somebody for damages and you want possession and they have all these other breaches of contract you want to bring, that's done through a traditional civil lawsuit, which can take six to eight months. Mm, Yes. (laughs) So what's ironic about all of this is that the whole purpose of the unlawful detainer statute was to actually decrease the liability of the tenant to the landlord for massive attorney's fees, charges, racking up damages, and really, really ruining that person's ability to recover from that financially if they just had to deal with the issue of possession. Just clean break, get out, and if there's outstanding or remaining legal issues between the parties, they could take that to superior court and do a, you know some sort of breach of contract and seek damages against each other. But the right to possession was what was supposed to be swiftly resolved. What the legislature has accidentally done is removed any benefit to the landlord (laughs) and even the tenant in some respects, if the tenant wants certain issues resolved. But really, it was the purpose of it was to be swift and efficient. It is no longer swift. It is no longer efficient. And I know for a fact that there are some attorneys that are seriously considering going away from doing unlawful detainers at all and just serving all cases as what we call a, a breach of contract with an ejectment, saying, We'd rather go to the superior court and go to a judge who can actually resolve all of the issues, even the issue of possession. And we don't have to deal with the hoopla that is the unlawful detainer process. And one of the pieces of that that's true is I've had cases get continued four, five, six times because the unlawful detainer process has gotten so sticky and ugly that the courts aren't even, they don't even have time for you. So you're like, I, I should have just gone through the traditional civil court process because I probably mm-hmm. would have gotten the issues resolved faster. <laughs> got it. Got it. So they kind of mucked up that first system. It used to yeah. be pro- very procedural. Now it is, it is a knife fight in court every single Ugh. time. No, thank you. That sounds terrible. It's terrible. I have a question for you uh, in terms of contracts. I currently have uh, some folks in one of my rentals who have received a job to move somewhere else. They have a lease with me until next June, 2024, signed contract. They would like to exit early, clearly. So my understanding, and I might get told otherwise right now, is that they are obligated to fulfill that contract until they find a replacement, someone that can take their spot to fulfill it. Is that true? Yes and no. (laughs) So first of all, I would never let a tenant find a replacement for me, not in the city of Seattle. I would make sure that I found the next tenant in the exact same way or using my exact same procedures and processes as I did that tenant, right? But they are obligated to continue paying the rent and fulfilling their contractual obligations, but you have a duty to mitigate your damages. So mitigation of your damages means finding a tenant to replace them. And even after a certain amount of time that it's sat on the rental market, reducing the rent you charge until you find someone that meets your criteria. Because if the market has changed significantly, you have to adapt for that. However, doesn't mean that you don't have damages. Meaning like, let's say if I have a three, let's use the 3,000 because that's just a clean number for me. If rent for this current resident is $3,000 a month through June, And let's say you can't find anybody that meets your criteria, but then you found somebody and they will pay $2,800 a month. You still can charge that other tenant the difference through the remainder of their contract. It's just the $200 difference that they have in damages and not the full amount. Um, And really, I mean, to be really clear about this, it's like saying you have the right to go after that money. Good luck getting it. I I mean, I kind of, I guess I just want to say, I don't think it's as clear and easy as as in anything in law. Yep. Let me show you where your right is. Yep. And then by the way, collecting it is a different story. So they could say no. Oh, I mean, absolutely. (laughs) I can't tell you that's like 90% of my job is (laughs) I certainly could sue and I certainly can win, but a a money judgment on a piece of paper is only worth the paper it's written on unless the person has assets. Now, one of the real hard downfalls of the right to counsel situation is that take a criminal defense attorney. You guys, we all understand that concept. It's so familiar in American culture, especially American jurisprudence. You understand if somebody 
that defense attorney's job is to defend that person regardless of what they think or know about that person's guilt or innocence, right? They ha- their obligation is to defend them with the utmost strength and integrity and to make sure that the, the system does its job, right? In unlawful detainer world, this is a new thing where they have a right to counsel. And those attorneys genuinely believe in housing is a human right. And they believe things like housing first mentality, meaning if the person is, you know, struggling with mental health addic- or drug addiction, that that person's not going to get better if they're unhoused. So they really will not only have their own personal vibe to this, but if the tenant or their client isn't really acting rationally, it doesn't matter. They have to do what that client says. That client says, appeal this case, even though it's cut and dry, like very straightforward, they have to appeal. They have to do what their client tells them to do. The problem is, is that's on the back of the taxpayer. And also the other party gets dragged through that process as well. So even if you have this motivation in the law that says, well, the winner gets a right to their attorney's fees, so they could rack up $100,000 in attorney's fees. Once again, this is a tenant who probably has underlying issues. They don't have any assets, so it doesn't matter. You're never going to get that money. So the balance of power is actually significantly on the other side. For sure. Yeah. So she just said that far better than I did. And from a legal perspective, it's to say there are rights in here, but but keep in mind, landlord, rights are rights, but it doesn't mean that it's all going to work out in the right way. Meaning, right, like you could sort of like in relationships, let me just be clear, if, if any of us, anybody on the call is in a significant relationship, you can be right till the cows come home. And it doesn't matter if your significant other needs to have a relationship with you and you're trying to create a lasting relationship, being right doesn't always matter. And in this case, uh, once again, it doesn't necessarily mean that the, the best thing's going to prevail. I think the way that I usually put that yeah. to my significant other is <laughs> there's being right and there's yeah. being correct and they are not <laughs> always the same. I'd prefer yeah. you come correct. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like that. I want to try to use that. When you're talking to me, you're talking to somebody who's like, you're talking to the doctor that's in the emergency room. So all they see is like the worst, craziest cases <laughs> in people in their just absolute worst state. Your view of the world gets a little bit skewed from reality. <laughs> But it is worthwhile to have that sort of perception so that when you're weighing a cost-benefit analysis, you're not going to feel shocked. You're Mm going to have something to weigh it against. So I have an example of that as somebody who came to me and said, hey, Caitlin, I need you to look at something. A tenant broke their lease. They moved out. They bought a new property. They're on my lease for another three months. They want their entire security deposit back because I didn't send the security deposit statement until the 22nd day rather than by the 21st day. And they also, I found a new tenant. The tenant's going to pay just as much. They're willing to move in, but there's one month of a gap. What do you think I do? I said, you give them back their security deposit because that's exactly what the law says you have to do. (laughs) You missed the deadline. You got to follow the deadline. And you give them that month back and you laugh your way to the bank. Because at the end of the day, if they sue you for failing to comply with the state statute, they're entitled to the security deposit times two. So they had a $5,000 security deposit. They're going to come at you for $10,000 and they're going to be entitled to every penny of that. Wow. So, you know, but the thing is, is that that person to me might seem like, wow, that perspective just seems so unfair to me. But seeing what I see, I'm like, that's the easiest case I could possibly handle. I'm like, you just, you already (laughs) have a new tenant. If you haven't built in into your budget, a one month gap at any point, and you don't add that as a cost of doing business, then you shouldn't be in the business anymore Mm -hmm. (laughs) because you're going to get, somebody's going to railroad you. (laughs) Right. And it'll happen for sure. I wanted to talk a little bit about the security deposit and I, and this might be a pandemic change too. You can clarify, but it used to be when you rented a house or rented something that the security deposit would be your first and last, let's pretend. 
and security deposit, right? So all of this money up front, the landlord gets to sock it away. You can talk about that as the next question. Where does that money go? Legally, where does it have to be? But tell us a little bit about the changes around the security deposit. Well, that's a little bit tough because there's more changes that are being discussed in the legislature right now. So my information now might be outdated even three weeks from now. So the reality about the security deposit is one is that you have to allow a tenant to pay a security deposit in installment payments if that's what they want. I can't remember what the breakdown is off the top of my head, but I have a feeling in my head it's three or four installment payments that you have to be able to offer them to pay everything down. I think the first month's rent is not really negotiable in that front, but I'm pretty sure the security deposit and the last month's rent are included in the in the installment payment. If the last month's rent is even allowed anymore, it just depends on the city. (laughs) And isn't it over six months too? I thought there was a time limit. It could be six months. I don't have it memorized off the top of my head anymore. Totally fine. Plus, I always feel like it's like it might have been three months a little while ago, and then it changed to four, and then it changed. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's for changed. sure. It, that's Keep the problem right now is yeah. you yeah. don't know. But the idea there is the tenants were really struggling to amass that much capital just to be able to, you know, move when they wanted to move. And so the idea was they will pay you, but they just have to be allowed to elect to make payments on those funds in installments. So that's kind of the name of the game. I don't know. I haven't had very many cases where that's been a problem because what happens is that if the tenant agrees to that installment payment and then they fail to make it, that's usually considered rent by the definition. So you would pursue that tenant in the same way as if they didn't pay rent. Yeah. So uh, clearly it's expensive to live in this town. There's no doubt about that. And certainly understanding that law coming into effect to say, let, let's go back to that 3000 a month, right? A rent, rent payment. You know, if you're having to come up with nine grand just to move in on day one, that's cost prohibitive for a lot of people. So stretching that out over time makes sense. One of the fears as a landlord is that if you stretch it out and then they don't pay it and then they don't leave, your backup sort of security deposit, help pay the rent situation, pay the mortgage goes away at the same time. So, well, let me jump in there and let's, let me, if you don't mind, I'd like to discuss some of the tools that I walk people through in terms of like what, if you own a rental in Seattle, what are the things you can do to protect yourself, right? When you're, when you're having a, a tenant or changeover in tenancy, unfortunately, one of the tools is charge market rate rent. I mean, I have so many cases where a landlord wanted to, what I call no good deed goes unpunished situation. (laughs) (laughs) They wanted to provide, you know, housing to somebody that could not pay market rate rent. And I can't tell you how many of those cases come to me and they absolutely devolve. And so for whatever reason, treating this asset and this business as a true business, not a charity. (laughs) Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And really following what a cutthroat business would do in terms of charging the absolute market rate rent for whatever reason, I get very few of those cases coming my way. And I don't know why I can't tie these things together. It would probably come with a bunch of assumptions that don't make sense. But I'm just going to say that market rate rent is a great indicator that you're running the thing like a business, like Mm, a business would. Making sure that your rental criteria are A, legally compliant, because obviously one of the things that cities do is they actually attack what can be considered in your rental criteria at all and put an asterisk next next to this because they're coming for credit scores next. But, you know, criminal history, for example, the Washington State Supreme Court just, oh wait, no, it wasn't even the Supreme Court. I think it was the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Friday, I think, overruled the Seattle ban on criminal history checks as part of rental criteria. But that's been going on for years. Um, Mm. I won't get into the legal details, and it's not that you can just use criminal history as a blanket uh, denial for somebody's application. But the reality is, is that Seattle for a long time had a ban that you couldn't even ask about somebody's criminal history as part of Mm. a rental criteria. So Mm. making sure your criteria are up to date, strictly enforced, and obviously legally compliant. And obviously I would say credit score, as long as we can still use it, 
and income rent to income ratio. Those are tools in your toolbox. Use them. Make sure that you are really creating the picture of the person that you would want in your investment. This is a business transaction. One of the other pieces of advice that I have that comes up over and over again is these laws, if you're Seattle-based, change all the time. It is a full-time job just keeping up with Seattle alone, not, not mentioning <laughs> King County, Kenmore, Burien. I mean, every council is doing their own thing. They have their own political agenda, and a lot of them have no idea what they're really doing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, that's just the truth. And so if you aren't, if you don't have the bandwidth in your life as an investor to be really keeping up on these things, I really encourage people to just hire a professional property manager. And let me explain how serious I am about that. I used to be a landlord in the state of Washington. Shocker, not one anymore. (laughs) I'd (laughs) seen, I'd just seen too many things. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. But even me as a attorney uniquely suited to manage these things, I had a professional property manager handling my properties because that was just emotional anxiety that I didn't want to deal with on what I considered my personal time. I wasn't prepared to treat that as a business and running a business. So then I said, you know what? I need to take my own advice. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But professional property manager that stays up to these things, in my opinion, is worth their weight in gold. Yeah. And let's speak to that just for a minute. I know back in the day, you could sort of count on uh, property managers being, you know, 10% of whatever. That's not the case anymore. And understandably so, their job has changed significantly. Uh, the amount of information they have to keep up on, the kind of circumstances they have to maintain, manage for you. So a lot of them are 20, 25, 30% now of that monthly income going to them and can't agree more. They're, they're, I guess as a realtor, I'll say this too, and you can say the same thing probably too, Caitlin, is there are professionals for a reason. That's what they do. That's all they do. They're really good at it. And so can you do it? Of course, you could probably figure it out. Should you do it? That's a whole different story. (laughs) Um, And do you want to give away that kind of time to be able to do it to save the minimal amount you're saving to say, I'm doing this myself. We, we get that for people that say, hey, I could throw a sign in my yard and sell a house tomorrow. That is true. Um, would you make the most money? Would you follow all the laws? Would you protect yourself from lawsuits later? All of that's up for grabs for someone doing it without a professional. So in this case, yeah, go ahead and get a good property manager in place for you. And I would, I would strongly encourage people, if you're going to take that advice, vet your property managers, look at the contract there's definitely wiggle room for negotiation. Like, let's say there's non-payment of rent. I mean, you can negotiate the exposure between the property management company and yourself. Those are tools that you can put in your toolbox or pieces of part of the negotiation process. The other thing that I would say is make sure that when you are um, vetting a property manager, that you, you make sure that they manage that particular area and have other properties that they manage in that area. Because a Pierce County property manager might not necessarily have the skill set or knowledge for managing King County or for Seattle in particular. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. a local hands-on property manager is is key. And I will say this about property managers. That job has become incredibly dangerous. I mean, physically dangerous. Um, if there's any city council member that dares listen to this podcast... <laughs> Let me, inc- or state legislator, anybody who will <laughs> listen to me in that yeah. they have required for serving notices of any kind that you go to the door and you knock and you wait. Doesn't matter if that person is clearly having a mental health breakdown, says wow. they have a gun, says that they will kill you. It doesn't matter to serve notice. You have to knock on that door and wait for them to answer and try to hand them that notice. I can't tell you how scary that is and how many physical problems I've created. And we're offloading that onto a property manager. I am hoping that the laws change to say, you know what? We can have other methods of notifying somebody that they've been in breach of their lease or creating a nuisance. Like we can't continue to put people in danger like this. Um, For sure. Hopefully they'll hear uh, that. One of my friends lost her father two years ago 
because he went to collect rent from a tenant who hadn't paid in months. And this was a longtime tenant he'd had who had a mental lapse, had a breakdown, and shot him, killed him. I am um, so sorry, but that's exactly yeah. to my point. It has become mm-hmm. incredibly dangerous. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So is there, let me just do this to circle back and we're going to, we're going to finish up here shortly. If you're listening to this podcast and you're feeling a little bit like I feel, which is to say, I think I need to list all my rentals today and get rid of them in Seattle. uh, You're not alone. There are investors that are moving out of this market, trying to get to cities with fewer requirements, et cetera. I will also say that for many, many years, I've successfully navigated this rental market. It can be done. So don't be dismayed completely. But I think Caitlin's advice about how you do it, the reserves that you have, anticipating and keeping up at least um, on a cursory level as a landlord, and then passing that responsibility onto a property manager that you've vetted are ways that help you prep yourself to be successful. Is there anything you'd add to that, Caitlin? I mean, what I go back to every single time is you need to treat this like a business with what a business would do in any scenario. You'd have a war chest and you'd hire professionals to do all the things that require professional work. Mm -hmm. That means if there's a broken toilet, unless you're a plumber that's licensed and bonded, you do not go to that property and try to fix that toilet. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You send the professional. People think, oh, I'm... All I do is process evictions every day. I don't. Um, actually, what I what I like to do is I process rent assistance every day. So oh. one of the things that I want uh, listeners to know is that another big change that happened in 2021 was the right to reinstatement. Meaning mm. previously, if you made a formal demand with proper notices for a tenant to pay rent or vacate, if they didn't pay rent in the timeline and they didn't vacate in the timeline, their tenancy effectively was terminated and they had to go. That's not the case anymore. Hmm. In under state law now, under RCW 5918.410, they have a right to use rent assistance funds to pay the outstanding rent even after a judgment and a writ has been ordered. So you could be six or eight months into this process and finally get your day in court win, get the money, judgment, get the writ of restitution, and they can still force you to reinstate that tenancy. Wow. Reinstate means like it never happened. There's still a oh. tenant and they're back in and you're back to square one. It's if they basically proffer the payment. Now, what Washington State has done is they've got oodles of money put aside that's exactly for that. So most of my mm. cases are me just processing the paperwork for unlawful detainer. And then I get a letter from a rent assistance company that says we can pay the outstanding rent. And so we're going to pledge that to you. You have to stop your case and you have to reinstate that tenant. What people need to know is that they don't have a right to attorney's fees at that point. So you have to have enough money set aside and your we call it the cost of doing business to pay for the attorney's fees out of your pocket because you will not be made whole from that. And they can do that three times in a year before they can't go back for those funds anymore. So that's something that was totally new, totally different. It used to be in the mentality of many investors that, oh, well, the quickest and easiest way to remove a tenant is to just go through a non-payment of rent case. That's Mm -hmm. not the case anymore. You're just going to end up in a merry-go-round of rent assistance. If you have behavioral issues, you need to go after the behavioral issues. Mm, But that's something that I needed to add because that's a very different environment now than it used to be. And just to be clear, give us an example in terms of uh, someone who has been trying to get rid of a tenant because of non-payment. Eight months goes by, they finally get you know a judgment, whatever's happening, and then they get rent assistance and they're back in the pool. How much do you think they would have spent in addition to non-payment that they're just going to have to absorb, let's pretend, to get back to square one? You mean on attorney's fees? Yeah. Oh, I mean, it just depends on the facts. I mean, some of mine are very different. It just totally depends on the facts. But I would say, an okay. av- let's let's take like a ballpark average for just non-payment, cut and dry non-payment, no special song and dance. Yeah, we're going to talk between two and a half to three to four thousand dollars on average. But it definitely depends on the facts. Sure. If it were me, course. I'd be assuming you're going to eat five grand just because I'd love overshooting than undershooting. If it's non-payment. Yeah. If there are behavioral issues, and remember, there's a new case down from December 5th that hopefully gets overturned because it's garbage. 
but it's called Sherwood Auburn versus Pins On. And it's a Washington State Court of Appeals case that's going to the Supreme Court. But it basically is being held to mean that you can't serve multiple notices at the same time anymore, even for different breaches. So let's say you have a 14-day notice to pay rent or vacate, but you also serve it at the same time as like a 90-day notice to personally occupy. You can't do that anymore under Pins On. You get to pick one notice and move under that notice. And then you can serve another notice, but it has to be after that other notice has resolved itself. So if you have multiple breaches, you pretty much just have to pick and choose your favorite and try to go with that one. (laughs) (laughs) That sounds terrible. Right. Let's see, which one is going to be the least money? Yeah. 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 That's kind of how it is right now. So behavioral though, I mean, the benefit of behavioral is it creates an issue of fact and at least you get your day in trial. You pay, yeah. may, might pay more for it, but at the end of the day, you can't reinstate when the person has been found guilty of removing their front door multiple times. Right. <laughs> for example, how random is that? Yeah. Oh my right. gosh. Well, I feel like, Kaylin, we could probably talk for another two hours and not even start to scratch the surface, but I do think that this is helpful for realtors that are talking to potential investors giving them some reality check on what it's like right now, all the changes that came into effect in the last three years and are still being worked out regularly, sounds like. But I appreciate all that you've added to this conversation and also just you as a resource. Um, It's good for me to know. So thank you. Thanks for being on the show. No problem. Thanks for having me. And hopefully all I didn't right. scare people too much. I just want to give them all the facts. <laughs> no, we're, we're, we're dutifully scared and now we just got to figure out what's next for us. Thanks again. Appreciate it. Welcome. Have a good one. Thank you so much for listening in to Pocket Hours. I hope this has been interesting, fun, made you laugh, made you think, spurred you on to do and implement some new things in your business. I appreciate your time and hope this has been a good use of it, period. Now, go be the agent you would hire.